Now, today we have a guest preacher, and I'm excited to introduce Kote to you in, in just a moment. Uh, but first, I want to pray uh, for her, invite Kote to come up and get her stuff situated so she's ready to go, and then I'll give a little introduction. So would you pray uh, with me? God, we know that this is your word, and your word is better than all of our best words put together. You've given us life, and you've given us instruction of how to live that life. Most often, we fail you, God, because we don't trust you enough. And so, Lord, we pray that in this space, as we open up your word and we open up our hearts, that you would speak through your word to our hearts, that it would come out in our lives in a way that actually blesses and benefits other people. We thank you that you're already ahead of us and that you've given us every single thing we need. All we need to do is turn toward you. So in this moment, would we turn toward you? Amen. Have you ever been somewhere uh, and met somebody that you can't wait to have another conversation with? Anybody had that before? Yeah, a lot of us, right? And have you ever been somewhere with someone who you've enjoyed a conversation with that you can't wait to learn, tell what you just learned about to someone else? Yeah, all the time, right? So uh, earlier this fall, I happened to be sitting at a board meeting for Trinity Christian College, and Kote came in and made a presentation to the board about what Trinity is doing. Kote's role, I'll get this exactly right here, is the Director of Tuition and Transparency and Access. Am I right? Yes. Very good. (laughs) <laughs> and now you're currently working to launch the Center for Transformative Neighborhoods throughout yes. Chicago land, right? Yes. Very good. And so she shared this presentation and she talked about the <clears throat> imagination that the church and the community can have when we face obstacles. I walked away and said, I need to get her to Christ Community Church. I need to get her to share because we're about to do some really incredible things. Kote is described by some as a spiritual entrepreneur. What a cool title. I did not know that. You, that's how some people <laughs> describe you. And Cody has done some amazing work previously in Seattle to start a coffee shop in a low-income community to secure access um, for an art center and uh, to work and lead a, a, an initiative to decommission a highway that was dividing a community. So she's done some incredible work, and now she brings that to Chicagoland. It's easy to look in Chicago and say there's so many problems, right? Do you know that God is already at work in Chicago? that God's giving the church resources to do something about that. Kote's here to help you by reading the scripture this morning to learn what God wants to do through our church. So would you, Christ Community Church, welcome our friend, Kote Sorens. Hey, thank you so much, Chad. Well, good morning, Christ Community Church. How are you? Good? Hey, that's a really nice welcome. Thank you so much, Pastor Chad. It was, I think it's mutual. Uh, After meeting Pastor Chad at the Board of Trustees meeting, I was really excited to hear about Christ Community's Church, Um, new ventures and this season of imagination and abundance that you guys are engaging. It is so inspiring to me. Um, Let me first, first things first, why does she talk so weird? (laughs) The accent is from Chile. If you go straight to the West Coast, take a boat, and go all the way down left, that's how you find my country. We are lucky to have made it into the planet, we say, because uh, we're way down there. So um, I, I just moved to Chicago on March 29th, and I spent 18 years in Seattle, which is quite a different place um, faith-wise than that the Midwest actually is uh, very secular, like very secular and very uh, self-righteous in different ways. Um, Whereas we're used to hearing like self-righteousness in a religious way, uh, sometimes in in Seattle, it was a little bit of self-righteousness in a very um, political way. And that sometimes created a number of challenges that I think were a gift and and really shaped the way I went about things. Uh, But one of the biggest gifts that I got out of that time was truly have the experience of trying all sorts of different ways of wanting to engage change in the world and coming to the conclusion that there was absolutely no substitute for the work of the church in the world. Amen? There is no substitute for what the body of Christ can do in the world. There is no technique no social technique, no economic technique, no philosophical technique that can replace the mystery of the body of Christ in communion with God, unfolding 
the work of redemption in the world. May, can I get an amen? So when I hear about a church getting ready to step into their neighborhood with courage, compassion, and curiosity, that to me is the good news. That to me is the gospel. Um, so I'm here to tell you that the church is so important today. Um, we are uniquely positioned to step up and respond to the moment and to the aches of our world. And I'm going to go into that in a moment. I was, it's my first time here, so I was not ready for that. We hadn't read the scripture for today, so I'll, I'll, we'll go over it. Um, I chose the scripture for today uh, that I think is really great because it provides us a model of engagement in the world. So many times in church, we'll hear about why we need to go and engage our community, right? There is so much suffering, we need to respond. It's not often that you find a church that is ready to go and is wrestling with how? How are we supposed to do this? So when Pastor Chad invited me to share with you, I thought, hey, I think I have a good one for you guys. Um, it's Matthew 14. It's the supper for the 5,000. It's a somewhat well-known passage. Have you heard about the, the feeding of the 5,000? Yes? Raise your hand if you have not. <laughs> no, I won't, I won't have you do that. Um, so um, this model, this passage, I believe, provides a model of engagement. So <clears throat> we'll go over it. <clears throat> and I'm so sorry, I'm a little... Um, and I'm a little... Um, I went, you know, I have three boys. And it was our first Halloween in Chicago. And <laughs> do you all remember what happened that morning? There was a blizzard, right, as the kids were doing the parade. And I did not have the adequate coat. Uh, so that's what you're hearing today, in addition to the accent. Also, English is my second language. So if I say something outrageous, take a moment and think to yourself, did she actually mean that? Probably I did not. <laughs> uh, okay. So also, um, I like sketch noting. I like doodling to express ideas. So Pastor Chad asked me, are you going to doodle? And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be nice to do a Bob Ross style of prayer? Uh, but no, so I just did it there and it's projected. Um, so this is, this is a little bit of what we will discuss today. There's Matthew 14, the feeding of the 5,000, and the model for church mission. Um, I believe that the church is called to serve side by side with God's spirit, okay? Uh, we are called to bless the world. We are called to bless our cities, our neighborhoods. Um, and um, the size of the problems are very overwhelming sometimes. Um, they don't match our ability. Um, for example, isolation. So many people are wrestling with isolation these days. People don't, especially the newer generations, we're, we're struggling with how to have friends, with how to do things together, um, which is causing all sorts of problems, health problems. <clears throat> there is a lot of polarization. People are no longer able to have conversations across difference in the same way that maybe past generations were able to, partly because we're not gathering together. Um, there is an erosion of the social fabric. All of this that create poverty, um, create violence, create all sorts of things, create hunger. So when we walk in our communities, we're often overwhelmed by the need that we see. Um, and how are we to respond? Let's go to the text. Um, on Matthew 14, um, Jesus was, this day, Jesus had just learned about the death of his cousin, John the Baptist, in a rather politically murky situation, right? Um, so he was going to take a mental health day. He was going to take some time for himself. So he got on a boat and went to a 
to a lonely place, to be alone. Again, mental health day. Jesus needed those two. Um, but what happened was that he was so famous and he was so great that people in town decided to follow him. So as he sees the crowd, he had compassion for them. And he did what he did. He did his thing. He healed them. And then it, be it came late, and the disciples, uh, so disciples who are very reasonable people, said, hey, they need to go and have dinner. We should dismiss them so they can go have supper, dinner. And Jesus says, like, no, no, that doesn't, we don't need to do that, but we don't have enough food. Well, how about you gather what you have, and then we know the 5,000 are fed, right? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> in order to appreciate what's happening here and how it applies to us today, I wanted to bring um, a notion to you. Um, in the church today, we often forget something that the Apostle Paul told us that we should never forget, which is that we are the body of Christ. We should never, they said, you must never forget this. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ everywhere we are at at every moment. Isn't that something? Every time that we get out of our house, a step into our neighborhood, a step into our office, go to, I don't know, Marshalls, Costco, go to the school meeting, everywhere. We are the hands and the feet of Christ. That's a lot of responsibility, isn't it? Um, and this means that we also live under a different logic. So, go back to the text. Um, Jesus is saying, now let's feed these 5,000 people which can be also equated to, hey, let's bless this neighborhood. Let's make sure that everyone in our neighborhood has everything they need. Let's be sure to sustain this church mission for generations so that we can be here for the children and the youth and they can be formed and shaped in the word of Christ. Isn't that the charge of Christ Community Church? Yes? That's overwhelming, right? The numbers have not been working for a while, which led to a process of imagining how are we going to solve this? How are we going to survive? There is no more intergenerational giving. There is, uh, we need to get crafty about sustaining the mission. I can see you have basketball hoops here, so I can't imagine the kind of fun that happens in this room in between Sundays. Um, you are serving your community very actively, and that is hard. Sometimes it feels like Jesus telling you, feed 5,000 people with not enough resources. Let's go to the guy up there. What would it feel like if you were a disciple and you were told, um, what's your name? Lisa. Lisa, there are 5,000 people here. I need you to feed them. Right? <laughs> so the disciples were operating under a logic of, they were very reasonable. Sometimes they are the people in our groups that are the planners. They are, they are very reasonable and realistic and will say, hey, we need to make a strategic plan for this. We don't have enough budget for that, right? You know how it goes in those conversations. Like, we can't do this. But Jesus is giving us a different logic. He's telling us that the world as he operates is based on abundance, generosity, and interconnection, right? When I first got started working with this passage, I always thought of it as a response to the work of social justice. They are hungry, we need to feed them. But I realized later that that wasn't the situation. Jesus decided to feed them out of just practicing radical hospitality. It was just joyful. It was, hey, we are together. Let's just keep being together, which is also a little different and countercultural 
from the ways we often think about solving social issues. Um, I can tell you a little bit of my story. Um, so in Seattle, I was um, in a neighborhood that was uh, redlined. You know when a neighborhood is decided by the city planners that is not worth investing in, for whatever reason. And there are many of those in the Chicago area, right? Um, so there wasn't that many places where, um, I was living in this neighborhood, and there was a lot of lack of uh, resources. There were there was an, um, there were places for people to gather. Um, the immigrant community was um, being pushed out very quickly. From I don't know if you're familiar with real estate in Seattle. It's like very uh, very it, it it land goes very fast and for a lot of money. So these were very big 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 problems that we had. Um, and. Um, and I started doing uh, this practice of stepping in my neighborhood and just praying, um, praying for God to show up. And the first idea that I had was, and, and it was given to me by, I think, by the Spirit, was I want you to open a space from where you can practice radical hospitality. And that is how the idea of the coffee shop came up. So I started this coffee shop called Resistencia Coffee. Resistencia is the word for resistance in Spanish, and it was a cheeky name, uh, as in, it was 2016, so people were like, the resistance, you know? Uh, so, um, it was a neighborhood of immigrants from Latin America. Many of us were born into dictatorships, so uh, resistance had like a, some meaning to us. Um, and also, it meant to me, uh, the countercultural work of the gospel um, in a place. You know, it's like the resistance. Um, which in my tradition in Latin America means something a little different than in the States. Um, in Latin America, resi resistance, resistencia is, is bounded with solidarity, solidarity between people coming together in faith to uh, accomplish wild things, like to hit it out of the park, to throw a Hail Mary on behalf of the community. And to me, that sounded like the gospel. So that was my cultural engagement and named my coffee shop Resistencia. So that was the first step into practicing hospitality, which going back to the text is what Jesus was inviting us to do. Let's practice hospitality and feed all of these people. Um, and if we look at the way Jesus is going about this, I find a few components that we can draw from for our work here with Christ Community Church. First, God is responsive. Jesus was going to take a day off, but then saw the crowd and decided to engage them. So when Jesus hears the, the cry of our people, he responds. But how does he respond? He invited us into it. He told the disciples, you feed them. And the disciples were really, really intimidated by it, which is the same that we experience today. Today, we are very intimidated by it. Um, but God is also not only radically hospitable, he's also relational. So God designed the world in a relational way. He designed us to be in relationship with him. So in the work of the church, he does it in the same way. I'm responding to the, to the cries of the people, the people of, is it Lombard? The name of your neighborhood? Huh? Lamont. Lamont, sorry. The cries of the people of Lamont. And I have you engage in that response because we are relational, because we are the body of Christ, because we are together in the mystery of this relationship. And then, third component, they gather the gifts and resources of the community. I love that. Often missions, church missions and religious missions are thought of as we, the resource fall, going into the resource less and saving the day. 
That is not the case in the feeding of the 5,000. They take whatever the community, the community had that day. In the, the story, the same story is told in John 6, and in that story, it is a boy who comes up with the loaves and the fish. So they do take the gifts and resources that are in the community and implicate them in the work of transformation. What is there? Whatever we have works. So it's all you have, two, two fish and five loaves, that is good. We'll work with that. And then the fourth component is the spirit does its thing. In this story, two fish plus five loaves equals 17,000 plus. The 5,000 were only the men, so I'm, I'm guessing a partner, a few children, and some 12 baskets left of spillover. In the world of abundance, in the world as Jesus' ministry happens, we're in a world in which two plus five equals 17,000 plus. <clears throat> so there's a participation here. There is, and so there is an abundance, but it doesn't happen just in the, in the abstract. It happens with us engaged. Um, and this is, um, I, I really want to encourage you in this particular way, uh, in the ways that Again, going back, we have many ways of going about change. We have social justice, we have nonprofits, we have um, institutions doing work in the community. But the power of you as the body of Christ is needed today. Um, I did a number of things in Seattle. I did a number of things in my neighborhood. Um, and they were wild. The more I prayed, the more imagination God gave me for more and more ambitious goals. Um, but the problem was that I was alone. So have you seen the Adams family? Yeah? Okay. So do you remember Thing? Okay. So I was Thing in Seattle. Because while I'm part of the body of Christ, I was just a hand going around. And a hand going around is creepy, right? A hand going around is confusing. A hand going around is like, what's this girl's problem? And that mattered at the end. Um, the story of Seattle for me, and I want to share it with you a little bit. It's, it's, it's complicated because through prayer and a thinking of abundance, I was able to do a lot of stuff, actually. And it, it kept getting wilder and wilder, and it was moving forward. But because I was thin, and I didn't have a crowd with me, it was very easy for, um, it was very easy to take it down in a way. Had I had a crew with me, the body of Christ all together, a church with me in that place, I think it would have been quite different. Let me tell you about the things that I was able to do on my own with Jesus, but just as thing, not as the church. So I was able to start this coffee shop, Resistencia Coffee, with gifts from the neighborhood. So in a way, it was really beautiful to project back to the city that there were gifts in my neighborhood, that if you put them together, we were showing that we were capable of doing beautiful, hip, and successful things. That coffee shop was hip, that coffee shop created revenue. That, uh, that coffee shop was able to practice radical hospitality, and people felt blessed in it. And it was a mirror back to the neighborhood that the neighborhood was a beautiful thing. Massive success. Then the coffee shop where that, the building where that coffee shop was was in the main corner of the neighborhood, the main financial corner. And that building came up for sale. So this place had become something important for people. So I thought, shoot, if it gets sold, we're going to lose this really important place. So I had been engaged in um, equitable development, in land ownership and real estate for a while, because you have to do that in Seattle, because of how the real estate works. 
And uh, we needed to come up with $6 million to buy that building. That's a lot of money. And I remember praying around the neighborhood and asking God, God, free the land for the people. Free the land for the people. And at some point, I invited my friends to pray with me. And my friends were not Christian. So it was an interfaith prayer, if you may. Uh, they were pagan. They were whatever, <laughs> spiritual but not religious, the whole thing. And we prayed together. Um, and this entire time, I had been a bit of a closeted Christian because it created a lot of red flags to say I'm a Christian. So they knew my work, and they were like, cool, we'll, we'll pray together. Well, what ended up happening was that God did answer the prayer, and we raised $6 million right on time to close on the sale, uh, which was really amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. It was, an, it was a direct answer to prayer. I was like, oh my gosh, like, did everybody see this? And I thought for a moment, hey, I've been listening to you all talk about the spiritual but not religious and astrology and all that for like 10 years. Maybe today I can just tell what I saw, right? I saw that we prayed and got answered the prayer. But that was not well received. <laughs> um, but anyway, we were able to buy that building and that building is today owned by community and it's great. And then the, 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 um, the dream started getting even bigger. There was this highway cutting my neighborhood in two. It was built in the 50s. There are many highways like that across the country. Um, and it was underutilized. And I thought, well, we need land. So how about we make more land? So I started this campaign to decommission the highway. And it started catching momentum. Um, and so, and it was really great. All that to say, um, those were big infrastructure projects. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think they're pretty big. And this was just one Christian, one thing, praying around the neighborhood. How much more can you all do, right? Amen, right? Like, hey, that thrift shop, I think I'm on my time. The thrift shop, uh, that's a brilliant idea. Um, that thrift shop that you're starting will give you access to being ice on the street, will allow you to nurture the fabric of relationships wherever that lands. And I really, I'm really looking forward to where God opens up a space for you. It will allow you to encourage the fabric of relationships, and it will allow you to do things that are truly countercultural. It will allow you to... Um, Radically pay attention to your neighborhood and to your people, which is a form of prayer. Simone Weil says this. Simone Weil says, attention taken to its highest degree is the same thing as prayer. Um, so counter, it, this is very countercultural if you haven't been on social media la lately. Being able to pay attention to face-to-face -face interactions is truly countercultural. Um, you'll be able to do that with the thrift shop. You'll be able to practice radical hospitality to your neighbors and start learning stories and start mobilizing help and start mobilizing prayer. And people will get to experience a little taste of what it means to be fed by the Spirit. And it's also going to invite you, and this is going to be hard, and probably it's going to be the hardest part of it, it's going to invite you to give up control and surrender yourself to this mystery of being engaged as the body of Christ in prayer and being part of Jesus' work of transformation in the world. And it's, we really cannot lose perspective of how mystical and mysterious this is. This work needs to be sustained corporately in prayer, and it needs to invite discernment, and sometimes you will not know what's next, and sometimes you will feel a little vertigo, and you'll feel a little lost. But it's meant to be that way, because it's meant to create space for the Holy Spirit to unleash 
your imagination, your resources, abundance, in ways that sometimes are going to be unnoticeable, and in ways that sometimes are going to sound so, so remarkable and impressive. It's going to be all of that. So I just want to thank you today for taking this on and for doing public witness and doing public theology, to being committed to do countercultural work rooted in the spirit, rooted in mystery, and let your imagination go wild alongside the spirit. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for this community. We thank you for everyone here, for their journeys, their hearts for you, the ways they're interconnected to one another, the ways they're interconnected to their neighborhoods, at school, at work, at the grocery store, everywhere they go. Jesus, bless this congregation to be a blessing in the three towns that are represented here. Provide space for them, provide multiplication of their loaves and their fish. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kote. That was Thank wonderful. Would you thank Kote with me?